Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 28th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio on the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the operating budget produced by House Finance that goes to the House floor for action this week. Second, we discuss again why we are concerned with the Permanent Fund Corporation's in-state investment initiative, especially in light of the ADN's op-ed taking the very same position this past weekend. And third, we explain why we urge the Senate to take up the recent House bill and act on campaign finance reform this session. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk about the weekly top three. Uh, number one is the budget. We went over this yesterday. Uh, some kind of astonishing things coming out of this, including this $532 million proposed by Sarah Rasmussen. Uh, now, here we have monies that we're not obligated to pay all at once, that we were paying at the statutory amount, um, that we were not paying any interest on, that was just kind of, we were paying, you know, we're six years away from payoff, so to speak. And all of a sudden, because there's a surplus, and apparently, according to the ADN, the fact that she understood that the PFDers were coming to the table, she wanted to get that money off the table. Sarah Rasmussen has proposed that we we just pay it all off now, even though we could hold on to that money, time spent, you know, investment, time on return, all the other things you say from holding money. But instead, we're just going to blurp it all out. That was one of the biggest shocks to me. You remember when uh, Scoop Jackson uh, was a senator from the state of Washington, and he was called uh, the senator from uh, from Boeing for yeah. all of the various uh, things he did along right. during his career to help uh, help promote Boeing. Right. Uh, you know, being a, a a boy from Everett, Washington, he wanted to help the hometown company, but uh, he was called the senator from Boeing. I, I think I think Sarah may be on her way to being called the senator from oil. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that that was a shocker to to see her uh, to see her propose that. No, and I guess that to blatantly admit in the article that well, she understood that there was going to be permanent fund folks who wanted to come in, and if there was money left over, they wanted so she wanted to take that money off the table, so it couldn't be used for the permanent fund. Which, wow. You know, it's a uh, it's it, what what's really surprising is is the votes she some of the votes she got for that proposal. I mean, Kelly Merrick, okay, Kelly Merrick, you can sort of understand, but Andy Josephson, Andy Josephson, who claims to be who's my representative from the district I live in, who claims to be you know looking out for working Alaska families, who claims to be you know focused on uh, on uh, on keeping uh, working Alaska families uh, uh, up and running, he voted for it. Uh, uh, and, and basically his, his theory, as I understand it, his theory was, well, you know, we're going to keep hearing about this anyway, so might as well get it off the table and maybe we can go on to something else. Wait a second. Wait a second. It's, it's, why can't you use that? Why can't you use that, uh, that, uh, philosophy for the PFD? We keep hearing about it. We should just get it down and get it off the table. I mean, right. That's been an issue longer than the oil and gas tax credits. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but that just, it flays me. No, it's a it's a it's a odd uh, it, it's an odd vote. I was surprised. I mean, I there there were there's been various layers on the oil and gas tax credits. The administration proposed a certain amount, and then oil and gas tax credits are tied to oil revenues in any given year. So as oil prices have gone up, 
uh, there was there was a, a a change in house finance to reflect the increased credits that are due this year as a result of oil prices going up. That I fully understand it, understood. But then for Sarah to take it the step beyond the senator or the representative from oil to take it a step beyond and say, oh heck, let's just let's just just throw all the money in the pot. That's just I I don't I don't, I can't explain that. Right. I mean, we were fulfilling the statutory obligation. It seems like let's just keep doing that, and we have uses for that money, like I.E. paying the full PFD to begin with, uh, or at least you know I guess paying back the CBR. There are many things that I would rather do than and just give it out when we could just pay it off at the statutory amount and have it done in the next five or six years. It just doesn't seem to make any sense to me. There's, there's one thing that I'm not clear about yet, and, and this may explain part of it. Uh, they may not be paying it out this year. I, they could be, but they, but they may be just putting that additional amount in the oil and gas credit fund uh, and have it there for, for when it's due in future years. It sort of, it's another way of stuffing money into a fund and doing it for savings. They're doing that with the uh, with with forward funding, house house finance is proposing to do that with forward funding K through twelve, <laughs> and that may be what they're doing with the with the oil and gas. Wait, wait, you mean funding. you mean they're dedicating funds? You mean they're saying that these funds can only be? Wait a second, I think that there's a little clause in the Constitution that says, "Oh no, no, I'm sorry, they're designating the funds," so that makes it okay. Um, I mean, what? Yeah. Well, in in any event, it's it's surprising to. Uh, I was surprised. Even I was surprised. I mean, somebody who's followed oil and gas for as many years as I have, and and uh, and and understand the ins and outs of that oil and gas credit fund. I I was surprised that uh, it was just sort of, hey, we got a bunch of money. Let's just let's just go ahead and just you know get it all out of here. All right. That was the biggest surprise. Of course, they want to forward fund education, which again. I, I don't know how you get around the whole dedicated funds thing, but they're going to do it for two years. One point two billion dollars plus a fifty seven million dollar bonus to schools, even though they're currently sitting on something like eight hundred million dollars in covid money that they haven't spent yet. But they're poor, 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 pitiful me. They get another fifty seven million. The university gets a big uh, gets a big bump as well. Um, what else? Hey, there's just so many things that are in this bill. And of course, you know, nothing about a PFD. Nothing about the capital or anything else. This is a seven billion dollar budget over the four point three billion dollar budget from last year, and they still haven't even addressed the capital issues. I mean, wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really uh, uh, skyrocketing. It's I mean, the seven billion dollars is is pumped up by the forward funding. It's pumped up by the billion uh, two in forward funding. So when you take that out. Uh, that number comes down a little bit, but it still comes down to you know five billion dollars against a, against a fairly steady four point five billion dollars that we had been uh, uh, running uh, running throughout. I mean, the governor's the Senate's been yet to ha, has been yet to hear from heard from on on this issue. The House floor, I mean, there's going to be amendments on the House floor, although these those will probably <laughs> increase spending. Um, and and the governor's been yet to uh, to be heard from on the issue. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal about Alaska a couple of days ago, and the governor was quoted as saying that he doesn't like uh, the forward funding, um, and uh, and 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 indicated that uh, he may be inclined to veto that. So maybe that maybe that comes back out. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he uh, if he does if he doesn't like that and he vetoes it. What he does with the oil and gas tax credits, but, right? Uh, there, there's a lot of steps remaining, but House Finance has certainly set uh, has certainly uh, set the the incline uh, on an on an upward uh, upward direction. Well, again, even subtracting the 1.2 billion for forward funding, it still puts us at 5.8 billion dollars. That's still a significant increase over last year, and it just shows. Uh, I can't remember whose axiom it is or what law it is, but basically government will consume every available resource and then some uh, if given the chance. And uh, and that seems to be the that seems to be the modus operandi here, again, with no discussion on paying a full PFD or fixing the PFD statute or doing any of that, just continuing to basically I mean, they've talked they got one ninety nine and some of the other things, but there's no nothing that's really serious. that has got a chance, I think, at this point of really passing or making a difference. 
Yeah, they had a, they had a vote on a full PFD. I mean, that uh, 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 Neil Foster uh, uh, proposed an amendment that would have paid a full PFD. It got defeated seven to four. It, it was it was an odd vote. It got defeated seven to four. And then the and then the amendment to go to POMV fifty fifty, the governor's proposal got defeated eight to three. Right. So somebody somebody voted for. I haven't gone back to figure out who that was, but somebody voted for a full PFD, then voted against uh, POMV fifty fifty. Uh, I'm waiting for there to be yesterday. We had Kevin McCabe on the program and he talked about the amendment process and everything else. And he said, yeah, there's going to be a lot of talk about a full PFD over the next few days. I mean, I would like to see a vote on the, you know, I don't think it'll ever happen. It'll probably get procedurally killed, but I would love to see an amendment on the floor that basically said, here's your full PFD. I, you know, let's put that in and see what the actual votes on the floor is. I don't know how, you know, how strident the binding caucus is on the house side, but uh, it would sure would be nice to see those members get a chance to actually vote their conscience on it and then have to stick by their votes since we're coming into an election season. Oh, I think we'll see. I think we'll see that amendment. I, I don't I mean, we've seen it in, in previous years. And what happens with that amendment is you pick up a couple. You pick up Neil and you may pick up Garen Tarr, uh from the from the House uh, uh, majority. But then you lose Bart LeBon, Steve Thompson uh, off of the House minority. And you sort of end up where uh, where you started by the time you by the time you wash that out. I mean, it'll be interesting just to, to, to see it uh, come up on the floor. I don't think they can strike it down procedurally. It'll be interesting to see it come up on the floor and where people land, but you've got to understand you've got the, you got the top 20%, the, the establishment, the business Republicans, uh, in the house minority caucus that, uh, that will vote, to, uh, vote to cut the PFD. I've always voted to cut the PFD. Give us your full, give us your, your final thoughts here on the budget as you watch to come out, you know, what, what are you thinking as you look at this? Um, and what does it mean going forward? Well, the trajectory's up. I mean, the, the spending levels are up um, and, uh, and House Finance uh, sort of uh, set a bar uh, for what they want to do. We have not yet heard from uh, Bert uh, over on Senate Finance side. As you pointed out, uh, we don't have a capital number yet. Um, and I am certain that, uh, that Bert's gonna, Bert and others on the, House fin- or on the Senate side are going to have their own peculiar little uh, niches that they want to uh, want to put money in. So uh, we're a long way away from uh, the end of the process, but House Finance has set the trajectory uh, as up uh, and uh, and up in up in significant ways uh, uh, in terms of as you as as you pointed out in terms of uh, the oil and gas tax credits, uh, additional university funding, additional K through twelve funding, uh, uh, various uh, savings accounts. Uh, uh, starting to be uh, starting to be restuffed. I mean, they 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 appropriated money for um, uh, uh, the higher education fund uh, that had been swept uh, by the governor. They voted to put money back in that. And it's not only Michael. It's not only FY twenty three that's getting affected. They put two hundred and twenty million dollars, I think, in the supplemental for FY twenty two. I mean, right. that's that that's that's part of the trick. Right. Uh, is is when you when you you know want to keep want to keep adding money in there. You do it not only in the in the next fiscal year that you're dealing with the budget on. You do it in the supplemental for the for the budget year you've got. And they put two hundred twenty million dollars uh, uh, in the supplemental. So it's I mean the trajectory's up. The question now is whether you know House at the House floor adds more to it. Um, and uh, when it gets over to the Senate, how uh, how Bert uh, uh, treats it when it gets over there. Donna asked a question in the chat room. Does Brad know who owns the credits? Who owns the oil and gas tax credits now? I know that they did. I know there was some horse swapping and trading, some of the majors and some of the minors. They swapped some stuff back and forth. Who actually owns the credits now? Do you know by any chance, Brad? Largely finance companies. I mean, largely uh, uh, the uh, oil companies that uh, that are entitled to them have traded them off to uh, uh, finance companies uh, uh, as in satisfaction of uh, of debts that they had run up. So it's not it's not so much the oil companies anymore. Um, there may be. I mean, I'm I'm I I, I will try to go back into this because I'm a little curious about why Sarah was so insistent on it. Her ties. Are more to the oil and gas service industry uh, than they are directly to the oil and gas industry, and there may be some. There may there, it may be that some oil and gas service companies are holding some of those 
uh, credits uh, in satisfaction for services that they render to the oil and gas companies. But it's 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 not so much the oil and gas companies that that uh, uh, develop them over the over the during the during the course of the program. It's the finance companies that that uh, that uh, 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 sort of have have helped them survive over the period uh, that uh, that hold those credits now. Um, what is? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm reading some of the uh, I'm reading some of the uh, chats here. Uh, it is funny you were talking about the swapping of votes. You know, you'll get a Neil Foster and a Garen Tarr come across on a full PFD vote. And I think it's almost like it, it, it feels it feels so choreographed, like the vote comes up and they are like, well, we've got to show our constituents that we're involved here. So you, you and you, you vote yes and we'll vote. We'll vote no so that we can cover our or backwards the other way around. We'll vote yes and you vote no so you can cover us. So we'll still have we can cover the spread, but we can go back to our constituencies and say, look, we voted for you. No, I mean, oh. it, it, how much of that is just like full choreography? Uh, well, it, 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 to a, to a large extent, but the real, the real dancer in that choreography is Sarah Rasmussen. I mean, she will, she will vote. She, she will count heads and vote for the PFD if the PFD is going to lose. I mean, it's sort of like Ellie Gray Jackson does over in the Senate, right? Right. I'm for the PFD. I'm for the PFD. I'm for the PFD. Oops. My vote counts now up against the PFD. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And, we saw that Sarah last year. That yeah. way. In fact, I think Sarah may have voted for uh, the full PFD in House Finance that will give her a talking point uh, uh, in, in her campaign this year. I mean, in, in prior years, she voted against it, but she may have, she may have counted a vote. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of choreography that, that, uh, that goes on. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll see that on the floor. I, you know, I, it, it's not uh, Thompson and Laban they're they're not chore they're, they're not choreographed on this i mean they're going to vote they're going to vote against it they've they've against the full pfd they've always done that they're, they've said they're going to do it but they're going to follow through with it uh but sarah is the one that uh, that dances around a little bit it uh it is uh it is uh uh interesting to watch spending is up no really yeah uh, and that's it. You know, I think you hit on the thing. My one of my favorite things to point out every year, and has been for the last twenty years, once I started figuring out the machinations, was always the supplemental budget, right? Because they'll always go back, and of course, if they reference spending that year, so let's go back three years, and spending that year was, you know, pick a number, four point five billion dollars, four point six billion dollars. Nobody ever references the supplemental budget that comes out six, eight months later, near the end of the year. That says, oh, we got to stuff another two or three hundred million dollars into there. That's never factored in because all they do is they here's what the budget that was passed, not what was actually spent. And I think that is the that is the shell game that gets me every time. Look at our look at our spending trend. We've done so well, four, four point one, four point three, when it's really four point five, four point eight, five point one, because they're coming back later and, and they're supplementing it at the end. And nobody really pays attention to the supplemental budgets at the end. I mean, nobody's really, you know, no newspaper is focusing on, well, this is what they passed, but then they had to increase it by 5 or 6% in the supplemental budget at the end of the year. It's just, it's astonishing to me that nobody catches that. Yeah, usually there's a there's about a $50 million supplemental. So when you do projections of where your budget's going to go, you usually add about $50 million to, uh, to, to that budget to account for... Uh, uh, to account for the supplemental and uh, but this year it's 200 and some odd million dollars so you know that uh, the, the proposal coming out of house finance at least is 200 and some odd million dollars so you know there's there's some stuffing going on in there and you're exactly right I mean it's a great place to stuff it because everybody focuses on the next fiscal year uh, they're looking at all of the bells and whistles that got added to the next fiscal year uh, and you just sort of you know just stuff just stuff a little bit in that in that in that back one and uh, and, and people don't pay attention to it. All right. Um, let's get a quick tease on number two, uh, which is the uh, fact that, shockingly enough, you agree with something that was written <laughs> by the ADN editorial board, and it has to do with permanent fund investing. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what it says when uh, when the permit when the ADN editorial board and I come out with uh, statements uh, uh, in the same direction in the same week. Last week on the show, I talked about. Uh, the uh, in-state investment policy of the permanent fund and my concerns about that and my 
my opposition to that. Uh, over the weekend, the ADN editorial board came out with an op-ed that's virtually the same. Um, uh, they had a few more bear, bells and whistles to it, uh, but uh, uh, virtually, uh, virtually the same position. So both of us are are uh, expressing concern about uh, about the in-state investment uh, uh, program that uh, the permanent fund has set up. We'll talk about that more uh, after the break. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We're coming in to talk about uh, the PFD, or excuse me, the permanent fund investment and the fact that Brad and the AD editorial board seem to be sharing a brain for a week or so, uh, which is a little terrifying to think about. Brad, what uh, what's going on here? Well, the, the editorial is entitled The Alaska Permanent Fund's Investment Mistake. And if you haven't read it, it's worth, uh, for those interested uh, in this issue, it's certainly worth going back. It is a, it is a soup to nuts uh, 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 takedown of the Permanent Fund Corp's uh, Alaska-specific uh, investment policy or allocated Alaska investment policy um, and raises all of the issues, the issues that I've been concerned about, which is favoritism to some Alaska industries over others, the concern you raised on last week's show, which is, you know, what do you, what happens if we have a, one of these investments that they've made uh, or uh, an investment they haven't made yet, but we start losing a lot of, uh, a lot of employees, the business gets in trouble. Uh, can, can the investment fund really disengage from that business or, you know, is there a lot of pressure for the, for the, for the investment fund to, to go in and help support that business? Um, and so it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, editorial for, for raising issues. It also did something, something that I hadn't uh, seen before. It also sort of brought uh, one issue out of the woodwork uh, that, uh, that some are using to, to defend the permanent fund uh, uh, corporation's uh, policy. And basically that defense is, look, we don't have um, a lot of capital in Alaska. Uh, the defense is we don't have a lot of capital in Alaska. We don't lo- have a lot of capital expertise in Alaska. We don't have a lot of venture capital firms. We don't have a lot of venture capital here. And so what, and, and so the defense of this policy is what we're really doing with that policy in part, what we're really doing with this policy is we're building up venture capital expertise and we're benching and we're building up venture capital to be used uh, for Alaska industries. And isn't that good, uh, the defense goes, isn't that good that we're, that we're injecting uh, this new capital and uh, we're attracting this new expertise to Alaska? Well, that's, I mean, that, that's, that proves the issue that I'm concerned about, which is we're using this money to, to pick winners and losers and to build up an Alaska industry that otherwise isn't being built up uh, through the through the private sector. There's not a sense of a of a need for it um, in the private sector. Right. So, I mean, even the defense, the best defense that I've seen thus far for why this policy is a is good policy uh, from the standpoint of the Alaska proves proves the point that I'm concerned about, and proves the point that that the ADN and uh, others are concerned about. We are creating artificially. We are using the permanent fund to create artificially. Uh, 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 business investment and business activity uh, in Alaska that the private sector otherwise doesn't think uh, is needed in Alaska, and and we're and we're propping that up, or we're supporting it, or we're creating it uh, through the use of uh, of permanent fund assets. I just I just think this whole you know dedicated to Alaska sector uh, uh, policy that the permanent fund has, has adopted is is going in the wrong direction. Uh, and I just think it sends us down a road that uh, has no good uh, endings at it. it you know, even, yeah. if, even if at the end of the road, what it does is produce a return that is in fact commensurate with the returns we could have gotten uh, elsewhere, we've run a bunch of risks going down that road that at some point uh, will go bad on us. Uh, and all we've done is we've gotten w- returns that are commensurate with what we could have done by not going down that road in the first place. Yeah. So I just don't, I just don't, I don't see any justification for this. And as I say, even the justification that's come out of the woodwork because of the ADN uh, editorial, I don't think uh, uh, has, uh, has any validity. No. And, and again, I think it, it hits on the key point of what you were just talking about, which is government interventional in, in intervention in the free marketplace. If there was a demand for that, 
private business would step up and private investors would step up and do it. The only reason they're doing it is because it's free government money, right? And then, of course, it takes more free government money to prop it up, and uh, and that goes that goes on and on and on. And it may develop a return in the end, but at what risk and at what cost when the money could be put in something else that is more solid, more stable, and uh, and doesn't, I guess, monkey with the with the free market at that point, right? And and we just and 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 it creates all sorts of of needs to to keep track of what it's doing, to put governors on what it's doing, to you know to 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 keep an eye on what it's doing that we don't need when the when the investment's being made elsewhere. Yes, there is a risk for conflict of interest. Yes, you know you could invest in a in a corporation in New York who which is run by the brother-in-law of the guy doing the investing. Yes, there's the risk of that. But the risk of that is, is a lot lower and a lot easier to look to, to look after than the risk of, you know, the shenanigans that could go on in Alaska uh, with uh, the brother-in-laws are a lot closer uh, uh, in, in Alaska uh, with, uh, with those sorts of investments and those sorts of policies. So it's, um, it, it's, I, I, as I say, the one justification that I've heard now for why this is a good thing still doesn't uh, sell it to me. It's just another. Our, it, it's sort of a it's sort of the argument is our industry is better. Um, you know, the, the the venture capital industry is better. It's important, and so you ought to favor us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about these other things. You ought to favor us. So it's just I'm. We're, it, it's picking winners and losers. Which again, government picking winners and losers, they don't really have a great track record on that. Let's just put let's just put it that way. Let's talk about the third big one, which is that the Senate, state Senate, should be paying attention to campaign finance reform uh, and campaign finance laws, which the House has has been paying uh, attention to. If you remember earlier on, APOC basically lifted all limits for contributions on candidates in an effort to conform with this with the. Uh, court ruling uh, and left it to the to the legislature basically to take care of the house has taken it up but the senate so far doesn't seem interested at this point brad yeah and that's and that's troublesome to me i mean i understand so the house passed uh, a campaign reform uh, reform uh, bill that would that would put limits on contributions in state races state and local races would would expand uh, uh, the disclosure requirements sort of reinstate the system we had uh, before the Ninth Circuit started uh, started monkeying with it. Um, and it passed the, passed the House with a significant Republican opposition. Uh, and I understand the Republicans had concerns with it, had concerns with that bill. But I don't think anybody should have concerns with, with putting limits on uh, uh, campaign uh, uh, donations. I mean, we have a top 20% problem in this state already that shows up uh, with uh, with the permanent fund, and shows up with things like uh, with the permanent fund corporations uh, investment uh, policy. We have we have a money influence problem in this uh, state already, and 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 I think it, I think it's foolish uh, of of any party, either party, to uh, uh, to not want to put limits back on uh, limits back on uh, uh, campaign. Uh, donations. I, I I don't know why the re- I, I mean, as you and I have discussed on the show a lot, Alaska is a cheap date uh, for outside money and for and for campaign donations. And I don't think that Republicans should feel that they're that they're somehow insulated from that. That they'll be the winners of uh, of outside big money uh, uh, coming into uh, to campaigns. Uh, and that, and that it will work to their advantage somehow. It, I mean, we saw with ballot measure two, uh, with the uh, uh, with the ranked choice voting, we saw the influence of of big money uh, coming into this state. We saw with ballot measure one, with the with the oil money uh, that came into the state, the influence that big money can have uh, on elections in this in this state. dark We've money. Sort of been insulated from that. Dark money, dark money. Uh, yeah, we've sort of been insulated <laughs> from that. Uh, with legislative races because of the campaign limits. But now if we're going to take those off, uh, we're going to see it pop up in those as well. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily work to the Republicans' advantage. No, so, it's not. Uh, the, de- the Democrats saw the problem in the House. I think the Republicans ought to see the problem in the Senate. If they want to make changes to the, to the House bill, have at it. 
but but we should end up with campaign limits with campaign donation limits uh, at the end of this legislative session uh ballot measure two about seven million dollars were spent on the pro side with uh with the ballot measure one the oil and gas tax it was just over i think five million dollars was spent so again overall not a whole lot of money in the grand scheme of things especially for outside interest groups who've got deep deep pockets uh a few million dollars to sway a whole state seems like a pretty good investment when it's all said and done it's getting pretty obvious brad to me you could look at simply simply look at what's going on for example in the anchorage assembly races you're seeing amounts of money in there that you would never have seen in the past i mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in a local race for a local essentially city council i mean it's a borough assembly or muni assembly but I mean, you're seeing hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, of course, gubernatorial races now rail, run, running into the millions and millions of dollars. If they take the cap off that, and, again, it only took $5 million to get ballot measure one passed and only took $7 million to get ballot measure number two passed, which is a drop in the bucket for many of these you know, uh, legal and political groups out there and PACs and everything else, it doesn't take much uh, with the number of people we have in this state. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. I mean, people argue that, well, Citizens, Citizens United is the, is the core of the problem as long as it exists. You know, PACs can have unlimited amounts of money and they can spend that in state races. So what's, a, what's the problem with giving it to, to individual candidates? Well, the problem is that, that it influences individual candidates getting those money, that, that money for themselves, influences them, I think, uh, in my experience, a lot more uh, than a PAC supporting them. If you've got somebody who's sent you a check for $100,000 uh, in your campaign and you've received that and you've put that into your uh, your campaign, you're going to listen to that person a lot more, uh, frankly, going forward, that person a lot more than you're going to listen to the PAC that happened to, uh, happened to support you in that campaign. Yes, you're going to take the PAC's phone calls, but you're not, you're not going to have the same connection to that to that money, to the to the source of that money that you do if uh, if you get it directly uh, into your campaign. Plus, PACs can't coordinate with campaigns uh, if they're if they're engaged in in, uh, in independent expenditure. PACs can't coordinate with campaigns, and 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 I think that layer is another layer of protection against whatever the PAC's doing uh, later influencing the can, candidate. Uh, if if somebody gives you a check for a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, in your individual legislative campaign, your gubernatorial campaign, and you can spend that yourself, uh, it, it creates a, a lot closer connection uh, with the with the source of the fund. So it's there. It, it, the fact that PACs can do it, I don't think is is a is a is a defense to why we shouldn't have uh, limits on uh, on state funding uh, uh, as well. Are you? I, you know, the governor said that that he's in favor of unlimited funds. I I think that's a strike against the governor. Uh, not not in favor of the governor. Is he concerned he can't raise funds from from individual Alaskans? Does he need unlimited funds in order to you know be able to depend on one or two donors to be able to run his campaign? I th- I think that says bad things about the governor that he's saying that. What do you think about Shreggy's proposal for the two thousand dollar limit with an adjustment for inflation? I think every five or ten years. I think it's ten years actually. Uh, what what is your what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, that, that individual component, I'm not, I'm not tied to, I mean, I'd, I'd be fine with another number. I'd be fine with adjusting for inflation uh, at a, at a, at a more rapid rate. To me, the important thing is to have limits, to not allow, I mean, if the, if the difference is between 2000 on, on a, on an election basis adjusted for inflation and 2,500 or 3000 or 3,500, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, uh, uh, go to war over that. But the difference is between 2,000 or three or 2,500 or 3,000 and 100,000. That's a huge difference. Right, right. Uh, and, and that to me is what we're talking about here. We're not talking, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't get caught up and let this whole thing drop because of a dispute about whether it ought to be 2,000 or 2,500 or 3,000 or 35. We shouldn't, we shouldn't let that be the, the, the thing that kills protecting against the hundred thousand dollar donation. Good point. Um, I'm going to ask you to pivot quickly here because Sean brings up something that I don't think you and I have talked about yet. Uh, there's been a, a bulk email release from the Permanent Fund uh, Corp and uh, 
It shows extensive political consultation and personal connections and alliances between Von Imhoff and Angela Rodell. Um, what are your thoughts on that here? I got about less than two minutes, but can you give me a quick synopsis of your thoughts on that? Well, it probably it reflects it reflects the friendship they had and it reflects the alliance they had. I mean, uh, Natasha was uh, was opposed to, to PFDs. Angela was uh, the facing court uh, for the Permanent Fund Corporation uh, uh, during the Milikowski Will, challenge to uh, uh, to uh, uh, Governor Walker's uh, veto. Uh, I think Angela uh, has had the personal problems with uh, personal issues with uh, the PFDs. Uh, as well, and so that that alliance with uh, von Imhoff doesn't uh, doesn't surprise me. I mean, I yeah, there are a lot of reasons to have been concerned about Angela. That is, the fact that she talked to Natasha uh, is is a very small one to me. But doesn't it reflect back now on this witch hunt investigation that Natasha is spearheading in uh, in uh, in the committee where she's getting the subpoenas and everything else? I mean. Doesn't it prove more the politicization of this than anything else in your mind? Yeah, uh, uh, probably so. But but I think I think Alaskans deserve. Y- yes, um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna figure out who did my friend in. Yes, it did sort of sort of explain right. that. But I think Alaskans deserve an answer to to why Angela was fired. Uh, in any event, again, I'm not the biggest defender of Angela. I think she went too far in uh, in arguing against uh, uh, PFD cuts. So she she will claim she never did that, but I think she did, um, and uh, I, I think there were a lot of reasons to be concerned about Angela. Uh, but I think I think we need to understand why the Permanent Fund Corporation uh, uh, terminated her. I think I think Alaskans deserve uh, an answer to that. Uh, just like you know, if if uh, if if the governor fired a, a secretary or a commissioner of natural resources. Which uh, uh, some commissioners, which some governors have done. Right. I think Alaskans deserve an answer to why we're doing that because it's a big part of our it's a big part of our uh, government. Right. And the Permanent Fund Corporation is similarly a big part of our government. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. We appreciate it, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top Three.